Good afternoon. I'm Mary McGowan, Executive Director of the Myositis Association. I want to thank you for joining this afternoon's webinar on isolation protocols, environmental challenges, and autoimmune diseases. We've had an outstanding response to today's webinar and appreciate everyone's interest in the session and are honored to be joined by today's wonderful speakers. Just a quick bit of housekeeping before we get started. Phones will be muted throughout the presentation. However, we encourage you to ask questions. There is a chat box located at the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions into this box at any time throughout the presentation. We will have a question and answer period after all presenters are done speaking. Next slide, please. The Myositis Association would like to say thank you to Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals for making this webinar possible, which is also streaming live on Facebook as a Facebook Live event today. This session will be recorded and will live on our website for future reference. Next slide, please. TMA is proud to partner today with the American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association, also known as ARDA. ARDA is dedicated to the eradication of autoimmune diseases and the alleviation of suffering and the socioeconomic impact of autoimmunity through fostering and facilitating collaboration in the areas of education, public awareness, research, and patient services in an effective, ethical, and efficient manner. The Myositis Association works closely with ARDA as a member of the National Coalition of Autoimmune Patient Groups to improve access to care, increase public awareness, and request more funding for critical research. Before we begin, a brief introduction to who TMA is and the services we provide. Next slide, please. TMA is the leading international nonprofit association supporting those living with myositis, their care partners, and the medical community. We were founded by Betty Curie, you see her photo there, in 1993, a patient living with inclusion body myositis. She began the organization with just 12 patients, and we have grown to be an international collaboration of organizations reaching thousands of patients and care partners. We celebrated our 25th anniversary in 2018 and are known as an international collaborator of research advancing myositis discoveries. Next slide, please. So it's a five-prong approach to what we do. We educate patients, care partners, and clinicians. We support patients, care partners, and the medical community. We're located just outside of Washington, D.C. We advocate regularly for research and policies that meet the needs of those living with myositis. We fund critical research, and we also increase awareness of myositis internationally. Next slide, please. On May 8th, TMA is hosting its inaugural Myositis Virtual Summit. We have an incredible lineup of speakers and we are excited to announce that we have added two bonus sessions on COVID-19. One session by Dr. Sonia Danoff on COVID-19 and lung issues and a moderated session by Dr. Chris Weil on research and clinical practices in the era of COVID. Next slide, please. And please be sure to check out TMA's COVID-19 webpage for patients and medical providers for the latest updates, videos, blogs, and researches, resources for how to deal with COVID-19. Next slide, please. I would now like to introduce Felicia Brannon, who has been living with dermatomyositis, inter interstitial lung disease, and pulmonary Art arterial hypertension since 2013. As the former executive director of community and local government relations for UCLA, she is a tireless advocate for those who have environmental exposures issues like secondhand smoke in multi-unit housing as part of their myositis journey. Alicia, thank you so very much for being with us today. I'll now turn it over to you. And Mary, thank you for that introduction. And I'd also like to thank the Myositis Association for giving me the opportunity to join you today for the conversation. As a native Angelino, I lobbied at the local, state, and federal levels of government for almost three decades, covering a variety of issues, mostly focusing on 
transportation, and land use. My career allowed me to participate in the development and review of environmental impact reports, which highlighted the potential and likely effects of a project on the surrounding community. Also, my former, employ my former employer, UCLA, decided to go smoke-free as a part of their Healthy Campus initiative. I worked with campus leadership as they developed guidelines leading up to its implementation. Given my background in land use and as a volunteer with Habitat for Humanity, the mayor of Los Angeles appointed me to serve on the Department of Building and Safety Commission. I should point out, I'm no stranger to managing a chronic illness. A month before I began graduate school, I started having seizures. Once I finished school, I became a patient advocate for the Epilepsy Foundation. That's how I come to you today. I started showing signs of dermatomyositis, interstitial lung disease, and as you said, pulmonary arterial hypertension in 2013. My symptoms included muscle aches and weakness, shortness of breath, etc. Simply put, I had trouble brushing my teeth and combing my hair. I was so short of breath, I lost the ability to walk and talk at the same time. And I couldn't speak without gasping for air. Concentrating and concentrating or completing a thought also became difficult. I received my formal diagnosis in 2015 after a multitude of tests, muscle, um, medical procedures, and a series of hospitalizations for pneumonia and sepsis, and a lung and muscle biopsy. I am currently taking Tadatafil, Celsep, Prednisone, and IVIG infusions. My initial time frame for remission was six to 12 months. Attempts to alter my course of treatment in 2016 and 17 resulted in flare-ups and bouts with pneumonia. When I was first diagnosed due to muscle decomposition, it was recommended I stretch every day. I thought, no problem, I can do that. Being physically fit was extremely important to me prior to the onset of the illness. I spent the majority of my time outdoors, running, cycling, hiking, in the gym, weightlifting, everything you could think of. However, the smell of smoke in my carpet made my stretching nearly impossible. Also, recovering in bed or resting on the couch after my three-day infusion was a problem because secondhand smoke followed me everywhere, entering my home through air conditioning vents, windows, and even medicine cabinets, every possible portal. I placed filters over the vents and tape to cover the open areas in the medicine cabinets, but nothing kept the smoke out. Most days I had to leave to get a breath of fresh air. I discussed secondhand smoke exposure and the possible link to flare-ups and pneumonia with my pulmonologist, and he agreed my home environment contributed to my flare-ups. Secondhand smoke had made my home uninhabitable. So I began researching. I found information describing various illnesses caused by secondhand smoke and data supporting its negative impact on my recovery. This led me to mount a smoke-free housing campaign. I wanted to get better. I wanted my illness in remission. I was sick of being sick. Finally able to walk and talk, I reached out to my neighbor about the impact her smoke was having on my illness and recovery. I even provided information to my HOA about how to go smoke-free. In both instances, my request was seen as an inconvenience, an inconvenience, excuse me, an invasion of one's right to privacy. For just a moment, I'd like you to think about noise. Within the privacy of our own homes, it's ours and ours alone, whatever form it takes on. But once it drifts beyond our four walls, it can be considered a nuisance to our neighbors. Most of us are aware of municipal laws in reference to noise, so we try not to be a nuisance. However, when I tried to bring up secondhand smoke as a nuisance and the damage it had on another person's health, I was seen as the bad guy. It is unfortunate that there are no aggressive laws currently confronting secondhand smoke in the same way noise is addressed. Secondhand smoke is a public health problem. According to the CDC, it causes 41,000 deaths annually and can lead to various autoimmune diseases as well as respiratory illnesses, etc. 
If secondhand smoke were seen as a nuisance like noise, so many lives could be saved and illnesses prevented. Knowing this, wanting to protect my health from further damage, I had to hire an attorney. Eventually, however, the loss of income and the cost of care conflicted with my legal battle. Worse still, not in remission as originally anticipated, I lost my job. My 27 year career had come to an end. While all of this was going on at home, I also partnered with public health advocates to develop, to develop a public strategy. Reviewing past legislative documents, I gained insight into the opposition's concern, which I felt was a bit one-sided. Seemingly proper consideration had not been given to the neighbor next door. Um, proper consideration, excuse me, had not been given to the neighbor next door, door concerning their health or the potential cost of care caused or impacted by secondhand smoke, knowing statistically all this information was available. I used my medical bills to drive this point home. The financial burden of managing an illness, especially while unemployed, is considerable. Finally, in 2019, I drafted a smoke-free housing bill for the California State Legislature that brought opposers and supporters to the table. I wanted to stay in California to see things through, but my health and home situation dictated otherwise. So six months ago, I moved to Maryland to end my exposure to secondhand smoke. It was a difficult decision, but necessary nonetheless. I left friends, family, and a career behind. I am happy to say, however, things have worked out wonderfully. For the first time in five and a half years, my prednisone level has finally been tapered below 10 milligrams without causing a flare up of pneumonia. And I am optimistic, fingers crossed, that the likelihood of remission is on the horizon. And I haven't given up the fight for clean indoor air. I'm excited to work with organizations like the Myositis Association, thank you very much, to shed light on this issue. I included the infograph that you see on the slide right now about third hand smoke because it's really talked about, but it is a problem just like secondhand smoke. I mentioned previously about the smoke permeating from my carpet in my previous home. Well, before moving to Maryland, I found third-hand smoke in the drapes, furniture, towels, linens, etc. I had to get rid of all of these things. I had to leave them all behind and start over brand new. However, when I was unpacking my books here in Maryland, I noticed the smell of cigarette smoke. I was so disappointed. But this further reiterated how damaging secondhand and thirdhand smoke can be. That's why I wanted to share my story with you today. Patient advocacy is needed to move the needle towards change. Like experiences shared with decision makers will help influence the development and adoption of smoke free housing policy. Breathing is precious. It's the first thing we do when we're welcomed into the world something we take for granted until it becomes restricted. At home, the place where we spend the majority of our time, we shouldn't have to worry about clean indoor air. It is far right, it shouldn't be a fight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Felicia, for sharing your story and for bringing to everyone's attention, the real importance of paying attention to environmental factors, uh, particularly secondhand smoke, and especially during this time of COVID-19 when many of us are at homes um, and how this is so very impactful in the home environment in which we are living in. Thank you again for being uh, with us and sharing your story. I would now like to, do, like to introduce Dr. Agarwal, Dr. Agarwal is an Associate Professor of Medicine at University of Pittsburgh Rheumatology Division. Dr. Agarwal is also Medical Director of the Arthritis and Autoimmunity Center, as well as Co-Director of the Myositis Center at University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Agarwal is the Chair of the Myositis Association's Medical Advisory Board. His research interests include clinical and translational research in myositis, antisynthetase syndrome, and association inter 
Celestial Lung Disease. Dr. Agarwal, thank you so much for joining us on today's session. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Mary, for that nice introduction. And um, thanks a lot um, for everyone for joining this webinar. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, uh, we'll, um, in next five to 10 minutes, I will talk about some potential environmental risk factors or triggers for various autoimmune disease, in particular, uh, myositis. Um, so environmental triggers or risk factors can be put into two major categories. One is infectious risk factors or trigger, and other one would be non-infectious risk factors or trigger. Um, Typically, any autoimmune disease, we, we have made significant advancement over the last 10 to 20 years, but we still don't know the exact cause of these diseases. Um, but we do know that environmental risk factors and triggers do play a significant role, at least if not in causing the disease, but at least in, in, in triggering or flaring up the disease, uh, the underlying disease itself. Next slide. Um, so first, I will talk about some infectious causes uh, of autoimmune diseases. If you look at uh, studies of various different autoimmune diseases, and in particular myositis, because that's my area of research, uh, there are various viruses, bacterial infection, fungal infection, that have been implicated in various different studies for different autoimmune diseases. However, none of those associations are actually strong enough to call, call that these infection are actually causing the disease per se. So their studies are either uh, contradicting to each other um, or not strong or not conclusive. So we don't know, as of now, we don't have a particular virus, bacterial or fungal infection that we can say that definitively causing uh, an autoimmune disease. But what we do know, next slide, that various viruses and infection leads to an overall activation of our immune system. Now, once the immune system is overactivated because of some external infection, um, bacterial infection, fungal infection, viral infection, what happens is if you have an underlying uh, disease already there, that can trigger, or if your disease was there, but very mild at, at a very mild stage or very well controlled, it can lead to a flare of that disease leading to worsening of your symptoms or new presentation of the symptom if your disease was dormant before. So at least we know that various infections can actually uh, you know, bring your disease and symptom more on, for, uh, for, forefront, uh, leading to various problems for our patient. It's very common for me to hear from our patients that I was doing absolutely fine and one fine day I had this uh, bad cold, uh, bad uh, infection, and then five to 10 days later, I developed this rash and then arthritis and so on. Uh, and that what happens is even though we know that infection may not be directly causing the disease, but it's very much possible that it's triggering uh, the underlying disease or flaring the underlying disease. Next slide. Now I will talk about some of the non-infectious triggers of autoimmune disease because we have better understanding of non-infectious triggers and actually more direct links uh, have been established uh, for um, at least triggering or flaring up the disease from uh, these non-infectious triggers. One of the main one is UV light. Uh, prolonged exposures of UV light actually can turn on some autoimmune diseases in our, uh, uh, autoimmune genes in our body. This leads to activation of our immune system. And as, as I explained to you before, in the case of infection, the activated immune system then can lead to development or exacerbation of autoimmune disease. Now, it cannot lead to exacerbation of autoimmune disease if you didn't have the right genetic uh, background or milieu to begin with. But if you have the right genetic background, then the activation of immune system can potentially trigger the development or exacerbation of your autoimmune disease. Um, next slide. A um, lot of people believe that UV light is only uh, comes from direct sunlight, which is definitely one of the main source of UV light. Uh, but being inside our house, there are various sources of UV light that we need to consider. For example, halogen lamps, fluorescent light lamps, a copying machine, 
uh, also emits light uh, which has UV radiation. Um, so we need to be mindful of these UV light uh, sources as well, as well as direct sun, obviously. Next slide. So what, what do we do? I mean, we cannot completely avoid sun. Um, so we just need to use common sense protection. For example, you know, using sunscreen, a hat, long sleeves, long pants when we are outdoor, lampshades when we are indoor, uh, you know, protecting yourself from copying machine, um, you know, shutting the lid uh, when you're copying. Uh, and some basic uh, uh, precautions can be used to prevent the exposure uh, of UV light. Um, and then that can prevent the uh, onset of some of these diseases or flare up. Uh, many diseases have been implicated. For example, a common disease that I will tell you is lupus uh, or dermatomyositis, uh, you know, have been linked with uh, uh, the UV light radiation. Um, as well as various skin autoimmune diseases have been linked with UV light radiation per se. Next slide. One of the uh, very common non-infectious trigger for all autoimmune disease is smoking. And our previous sp uh, speaker uh, spoke uh, very nicely about the risk of smoking, uh, not only first-hand, but second and third-hand risk of smoking. And I think uh, I cannot emphasize any more than our previous speaker actually did. Uh, that has been direct links with trigger as well as onset of various autoimmune diseases, such as myositis, uh, especially patients with interstitial lung disease, a type of uh, a rare subset of myositis is called antisynthetase syndrome, in which many patients have interstitial lung disease, which basically means lung fibrosis. Um, and where the links have been the strongest, obviously, because smoking you inhale and can cause direct injury to the lung. Um, even the diseases which may not have that much um, uh, link with the lung, but such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, or multiple sclerosis have had strong direct links with smoking. Um, and and th that obviously uh, one of the main thing that any doctor would recommend that uh, smoking is injurious to health. But when it comes to autoimmune disease, it's not just injurious to health in general, it's actually can trigger your autoimmune disease and underlying autoimmune disease or flare up a previously controlled autoimmune disease. So it's, uh, smoking is one of the key uh, modifiable risk factors for autoimmune disease. Next slide. Um, another uh, non-infectious trigger is various medications. We take, uh, you know, so many different medications. Uh, we take, you know, um, over-the-counter um, vitamins, um, herbal medications, this and that. But we forget that many of the medication may actually trigger autoimmune disease. And many of those links we may not even know. Uh, one of the most common uh, uh, and well-understood link is the link between statin and autoimmune muscle disease called necrotizing myopathy, um, in which patients who are taking statin can actually develop an autoimmune muscle disease called myositis, necrotizing myositis. Um, now, obviously, I'm not trying to implicate the statins are bad here. Obviously, um, statins does much more good than it can do any bad. But we need to recognize then when patient does present with some autoimmune uh, disease features, doctors and health providers need to take a deep look at their medication list to see if one of the medication they're on previously could have led to the trigger of autoimmune disease. And that's a very important aspect. Uh, one of the major problem we face about medication is patients sometimes are very upfront about the uh, medications they are taking that are prescribed, but they forget to mention some of the over-the-counter or herbal products or uh, vitamins and other products that they may be taking. And when you don't tell the doctor about those medications, many times doctors assume that you're not taking anything but what you're reporting right now to me. So sometimes we fail to establish the link between what you might be taking, where, where you thought that's harmless, obviously, where that's why you're taking it, but there could be a direct link between that and triggering, triggering your autoimmune disease. So I always recommend patients to tell your doctors all the medicines that you're taking, prescribed and not prescribed medications. Any of the over-the-counter or the medications that you're buying off the shelf needs to be told to your doctor. Next slide. Um, stress um, is one of the key factors um, 
in autoimmune disease. And it's very common for us to see when patients flare up, um, they are uh, typically under a lot of stress. Now, one could say that, well, they're under stress because they're flaring up, but that's not how, what usually happens. What usually happens is a certain event in their life um, that led to a flare. Um, and then sure enough, they may develop worsening of their autoimmune disease subsequently. So the worsening of autoimmune disease or triggering of autoimmune disease or, uh, could develop subsequent to the flare per se. Um, also, we know there has been association on, as per the studies that people with more uh, stress or stress disorders have higher likelihood of various different autoimmune disease. So that has been well established. Next slide. Now, the other thing is, the question that often get asked is, is the stress directly causing the triggering or flare up of autoimmune disease? Or is because of the stress, when we stop following the healthy lifestyle, for example, healthy eating, exercises, um, smoking, when we are under stress, we have a more tendency to smoke, um, or we not sleeping well, uh, we not uh, you know, doing the regular uh, behavior, a healthy behavior that we need to do when we are under stress. And that itself may lead to triggering or worsening of autoimmune disease. And that needs to be addressed with various studies. I cannot answer you, is it a direct cause of stress or is it the stress leading to bad healthy behavior that ultimately lead to the flare of the, of the disease? It is quite common for people when they're under stress to forget about their medication. So they've stopped taking their medication, which itself may lead to flare up of the disease per se. So, so stress has, has a strong linkage with autoimmune disease, but the reason or the exact mechanism or how stress cause or trigger of autoimmune disease is currently unknown. So we often recommend people to, you know, practice regular stress reducing behavioral exercises, for example, listening to music, uh, you know, a medication, uh, a meditation, uh, mindfulness, and all of these techniques are available nowadays to decrease your overall stress. Um, and also oftentimes, um, sometimes the this, this stress is not apparent, means the patient not aware of their stress, but they're worried underlying, subconsciously worried about something, and that itself may actually uh, lead to worsening of their autoimmune disease. So next slide. So in conclusion, we don't know exact cause of autoimmune disease, but we do know various infectious and non-infectious triggers of, of the autoimmune disease or exacerbation at least these can cause exacerbation or flare up of autoimmune disease. So it's best to know about these triggers and try to uh, develop some strategies uh, to mitigate uh, these uh, environmental triggers and, 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 uh, uh, and other triggers. Um, th with that, I think um, uh, I would stop here unless um, uh, I think the questions will be discussed at the end of the session. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal, for sharing your expertise and educating us all about these important triggers of autoimmune diseases. And yes, we'll be taking questions uh, at the end of today's session. So now I would like to introduce Dr. Jasmine Bauer Ventura, a rheumatologist with a main interest in inflammatory myopathies. She is part of the multidisciplinary intertestial lung disease team focused on patient care and clinical research. She also provides expert care in inflammatory myopathies, in particularly dermatomyositis, antisensitase syndrome, and polymyositis. Dr. Bara Ventura is currently developing an institutional registry on inflammatory myopathies and hopes to contribute to this field by providing more information on how these diseases present differently in the African American population. Her research has been published in the Journal of Rheumatology, Respiratory Medicine, and Journal of Sleep Research. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Bauer Ventura, and I'll turn it over to you. Hello all, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. I hope I can add on uh, to the amazing lectures that we already have, and I'll be happy to answer questions in the end. So as Dr. Agarwal just mentioned, 
This hypothesis that autoimmune diseases come from the association of environmental exposures and genetic, genetic predisposing factors is well accepted, although studying this association can be quite challenging. Uh, I would like to come back to one important work that was developed um, following the World Trade Center tragedy. So uh, important studies followed the, the rescue workers that work on that day and the following months. They found out, these studies found out that firemen, paramedics, policemen, etc., who were exposed to the dust coming out from the World Trade Center experienced a significant increase in the diagnosis of respiratory, gastrointestinal illnesses, and even cancers. Moreover, these studies show that these professionals were also more likely to develop autoimmune diseases of many types, and that the more time these workers were, were in the field, in the site of the tragedy, the higher were the odds of developing autoimmune diseases. Other studies have also shown the correlation of air pollutants with increased risk of autoimmune diseases, even in the pediatric population as well, and higher levels of pollutants uh, coming from traffic or industrial plants have also been associated with increasing disease activities in autoimmune diseases such as lupus. So such studies have provided even more evidence on the important, important impact of our surroundings. Where do we work? Where do we live? And our health and well-being. Well, so far, uh, next slide please. So far, we have focused on the impact of the outer environment on our well-being. However, since the COVID-19 has become a real threat to all of us, we have all restored to our houses, hoping to help flatten the curve of virus infections and deaths all over the world. This moment became a great opportunity then to talk on the impact of indoor environmental exposures inside our houses on our health, particularly with respect to the health of those who already suffer from underlying medical conditions, such as autoimmune diseases, and including inflammatory myopathies. The home environment does not completely shelter us from the harmful pollutants and exposures from the outside, but bring to the discussion other potentially harmful agents that we can find at home for which are common in the homes, uh, for which are sometimes more common in the homes of low-income families. Smoking, for example, already mentioned here so many times, but it's so important to again mention uh, how important it is. It has been banned on, in uh, some public spaces in several states and countries. Nonetheless, about 22% of the worldwide population, this, is, this means one in four people around the globe is to smoke, which means that the, the exposure to hazardous pollutants coming from tobacco smoke, smoke remains a major risk for non-smokers, not only through second, hand smoking, but also through third hand smoking, such as Felicia said. Decades of research have demonstrated the adverse effects of tobacco smoke on human health with absolutely no safe level of exposure. In addition to tobacco, mold that we found at home, smoke that concentrates uh, in poor ventilated kitchens, and the chemical agents that provide the perfume and the active ingredients used to combat pests and clean our houses every day have also been associated with the development of respiratory illnesses. In populations such as ours with inflammatory myopathies, uh, patients who commonly suffer from respiratory illnesses such as interstitial lung disease and pulmonary hypertension, such as in Felicia's case, these indoor exposures can be so harmful and this is the moment to discuss a little more of them. Unfortunately, health disparities exist in multiple respiratory, uh, respiratory illnesses, including interstitial lung diseases. International medical societies reported just recently that the groups with lower socioeconomic status are up to 14 times more likely to have respiratory diseases than more affluent groups. These disparities are complex and multifactorial 
may, but may be at least partially explained by the environmental health disparities. And the houses where we live may play an important role in these inequities. Lower income, racially and ethnically diverse communities are more likely to live in smaller and older homes, homes that are closer to pollution sources, such as roads and industrial plants, and homes where all these indoor environment factors are more common. Such disparities in house quality have numerous implications for numerous housing-based exposures with linkages to health outcomes, including exposures to temperature extremes. Patients who have asthma, patients who have interstitial lung diseases are way more sensitive to changes in temperature, extremes in hot and cold weather. Mold, patients who unfortunately live in houses of poor condition have more chances to deal with water damage and mold, smoking as we said, lead contamination, air pollution, past allergens, and peeling plants. Active smoking is more common in lower income communities, and as such, these communities are more exposed to first, second, and third hand smoking. Using asthma for an example here, Secondhand smoking has been linked to a dramatic increase in risk for development of asthma, visits to the emergency room, and hospitalization due to flares. Secondhand and thirdhand smoking have also been linked to impaired lung function, even in patients who have never smoked or who don't even have lung problems altogether. Adverse housing conditions, more common in low-income households, in urban or rural settings, increase the likelihood of pest infestation and subsequent pesticide use. Both pesticides and pest allergens can promote inflammation in the, uh, in the airways. Domestic fuel uh, coming from the combustion uh, of stove tops in poorly ventilated kitchens in small houses and apartments have also been linked to the increase in indoor pollutants associated with pediatric asthma, for example. The current health crisis we are experiencing right now have also exposed the social and financial burdens that low-income communities have endured, also with great impact on their health. With the rate of unemployment achieving the highest percentage since the Great Depression in 1918, 20, 22 million people as last week, Members of racially and ethnically diverse communities have disproportionately lost their jobs all over the country. On the other extreme, 75% of frontline workers in New York City, for example, are minorities. And for these people, safety measures that follow shelter in place orders are just not a reality. These families who are already living in the edge financially and now experiencing difficulties in paying rent and secure a safe environment that is so important for those who already have chronic illnesses. Many are living in overcrowded environments in which privacy and personal space are privileges they cannot afford. And where minimal space necessary to maintain minimal levels of physical activity and exercise, so crucial to the well-being of anyone and maintenance of health in patients with inflammatory myopathies in particular are no possible in these environments. Low-income families have experienced uncertainties with respect to food, schools are closed, local family shops are closed, they're also losing, losing health insurance and experiencing difficulties to connect with their physicians while also at home and afford medical supplies. Moreover, violence, domestic or coming from the outside have not halted amid the pandemic. I'm gonna give an example here in Chicago where I live, the rate of violence in the city have remained stable during the month of March when we were already locked down waters and even increased when compared to the same period last year. In addition to all concerns that come from the virus and indoor exposures as we discussed, these additional social insecurities may increase the risk for mental illnesses, depression, anxiety, which have been shown to correlate with cruel control 
of underlying rheumatic diseases, lower rates of compliance to medical regimen and increase in disease activity levels are also being more common in these situations. Unfortunately, the, uh, our most, most vulnerable communities, low-income low income families, African-American, Hispanic, Hispanic communities are also the most affected by these factors. For patients already dealing with chronic debilitating illnesses, all these additional risk factors contribute to the propagation of insecurity, inequality, and poor health outcomes. The COVID-19 pandemic has been truly an experiment on social inequality in this country and the opportunity to rethink how to better serve and protect our most vulnerable communities. Dr. Ventura, thank you so much for that extraordinary presentation focusing on home environment and the health disparities and the challenges brought by uh, COVID-19. I would now like to introduce Virginia Ladd. Virginia Ladd is the former president and executive director of the American Autoimmune Related Disease Association, also known as ARDA, an organization that she founded to bring a national focus to autoimmunity and increase collaboration in autoimmune research, education, awareness, and advocacy. Virginia is also an active member of the Friends of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, a broad coalition of organizations representing public and environmental health, children's health, and women's and medical communities. Virginia, thank you so very much for being with us here today. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you for the nice introduction and for the opportunity to be part of this webinar. So during uh, this pandemic, life became, has become an inside experience, especially for those of us who have chronic health conditions, such as an autoimmune disease or asthma, and must stay inside for the sake of our health. Today, my role is to talk about the inside environment of the home, and you've already heard some, um, some information about that. I will also try to provide some tips on how we can improve our inside environment. We have a natural tendency to think that once we're inside our home, we're in a place of safety. However, there can be several environmental issues that can impact on the quality of the environment inside our homes. When we think about air pollution, we often think of smog and chemicals and produced by factories or exhaust from cars. These are problems that usually affect the outdoor air, but there can be indoor pollution also. Most uh, of us spend much of our lives inside of our home, when you think about it. We eat our meals, do our work, play, sleep, <coughs> all indoors. And all that time we're breathing indoor air. So indoor air can become polluted by adding harmful things to it, just as the outside air can. For example, disinfectants, household cleaners, dust, paint, bug spray, pesticides, smoke from cooking or cigarettes, and even fibers from building materials can all make indoor air unhealthy to breathe. We often need to keep doors and windows closed to keep the inside of our homes cool in the summer or warm in the winter. And that can trap pollutants inside for a long time. It can also make places for insects, dust mites, and molds to live, which can also be a problem with the inside environment. So when we hear about um, in the infectious nat nature of the COVID-19 virus, one of the first things that we think of is disinfecting our environment. And that is important. Disinfecting surfaces, especially where hands touch, is an important infection prevention method. This is especially true if you have somebody who has symptoms or has tested positive for the virus and is quarantined, or if you have an essential worker coming in and out of the home daily. One of the first things to do when coming into a home, I'm sorry, next slide, I forgot about to say next slide, okay. Uh, before, one of the first things to do before entering the home is to remove shoes because shoes can carry the virus. 
Clothing can also carry the virus. And an easy method of decontaminating clothing, such as a jacket, is to put it in the dryer for 60 minutes on high heat. And if it is a dry fabric, it will not be harmed or shrink. So when a, somebody comes in, especially if they're an essential worker, they can take, remove their clothing, take a shower, put their clothing in a bag, take it down to the laundry or take it to the laundry, put it in a dryer for 70 minutes on high heat, and that will decontaminate it. So that, that's something that you can do regarding the spread of the virus. Uh, if a member of the household goes out for essential needs, or if you have somebody in your household who is quarantined because they either have the virus or were exposed, sanitizing light switches, handles, or anywhere that the hand may touch on a regular schedule throughout the day, it can be important. You simply take a disinfectant wipe, walk through the house, looking for the places where a hand might touch, and wipe it down. This could be a project for children. They may even be able to make a game of it. But it is important because hands carry the virus. That's why washing hands is such an important um, uh, habit to have to, to protect yourself from the virus. Regarding disinfecting different surfaces inside the house, it is important that you do some research to find out what disinfectants are safe to use inside and what works best on different surfaces. Hazardous chemicals are common in cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting products. The EPA, uh, next slide, I'm sorry. The EPA, uh, NIEHS, and OSHA have excellent uh, information available on the internet regarding the types of disinfectants that you can use safely inside the home and what surfaces that they are effective on and how long they must be on a surface to actually disinfect it. There's also information on how you can make your own safe disinfectants for various uses on most, but not all, household surfaces. So you wanna make sure that you have the right disinfectant for the right application. So disinfectants come in a variety of applications, including hand sanitizers, which we're all familiar with, wipes, and aerosols. The first step in protecting your home environment while using disinfectants, especially the aerosol disinfectants, is to ventilate your home. Open a window or a door to bring fresh air into the home when using a spray disinfectant. Many people with autoimmune diseases have chemical sensitivities. As the first speaker um, told her story, you could see that, that she has those issues. And that's true with many people with autoimmune disease. This can include paint, tobacco smoke, furniture, carpeting, building materials, scented candles, cleaning products, mold, and even pet dander. If you are one of these people, you probably already know what you need to do to protect yourself. Aerosol means to put it into the air, and because we breathe the air, we are bringing the aerosol product into our lungs. For most people, this would not be a problem. But for some people, particularly people who have pulmonary lung problems associated with some autoimmune diseases or asthma, uh, it can cause an inflammatory response. However, there is one issue with ventilation, and that is this happens to be a high time for allergies. So when you open a window and bring in air from the outside, you can also be bringing in pollen, which is in the air in the spring, so that it is sometimes to be, it is something to be cognizant of if you have a person in the household who has allergies, especially springtime allergies. So in, in this case, you can consider using an exhaust fan if available to clear pollutants from the air and using filters also on your uh, furnaces uh, can also be helpful. So other than the issue of allergies, ventilation can help remove not only the odor of the disinfectants and other pollutants and also can refresh the air. When thinking about using bleach as a disinfectant, you must be cautious about mixing bleach with any other substances or ingredients, as some can be quite toxic 
and this would be uh, worth researching to make sure that you are using something safe so that you do not make a mistake that can cause more problems that what, than what you're trying to solve. In addition to thinking about the quality of the air inside your home, consider the scented products that we could be using, such as air fresheners, candles, and incense. Sometimes we use these products, or these products are sold to us as possible stress reducers. So we know that stress is a factor. So um, for instance, the use of candles can be detrimental to the quality of air in, in your home, especially for persons who have lung issues. I have provided a link on the link page that will give you some information about how the use of candles and incense can detrimentally impact the air quality in your home. Next slide. Uh, when thinking about the virus itself, it helps to have higher humidity because the virus becomes heavier and will fall to the floor more easily when the humidity is higher. So in other words, is less likely to spread through the air. Well, that brings me to another issue within the home, and that is household dust. We all know that when you look through a light source within a home, you can actually see the particles in the air. These airborne particles eventually filter down onto surfaces uh, as dust. In that dust, there can be bacteria, there can be viruses, there can be mold, and there can be other harmful airborne particles. So when you dust, it's best to use a slightly damp cloth uh, as the dust will cling to it rather than be reintroduced into the air. And there are many products out there that are not damp, but the still have, uh, the dust will still cling to that particular material uh, because that's what it was manufactured for. But just dusting with a feather duster in that, you can just really reintroduce the dust into the air. Uh, the National Institute of Environmental Health Studies has an article that I will put on the links page where you will find more information about household inborn airborne particles and how you can have a healthier home. Sometimes we do not think of any, anything of leaving food setting out for just a little while uncovered. Very common. But airborne particles and molds particularly filter down and become a source of mold formation and contamination of the food. So to wrap up, another inside home environment tip, and we've talked about stress already today, um, but these are just some tips um, of how you might be able to reduce it. So one of, the one of the tips I'd like to add is when you're sharing space with others for, for a prolonged period, period, and no matter how much you love them, it can create stress. Everyone may benefit from a time out. My recommendation is to take a time during the day, a certain time when everyone goes to a different location in the house and spends a half an hour to an hour doing a quiet activity, such as reading, putting puzzles together, doing arts and crafts. Being by yourself can lessen your stress. This might be a time when you want to spend some time meditating or just daydreaming or whatever quiet activity that you know helps you relax. If you have young children who take naps, this might be the time for the family timeout because it's important that everybody be quiet at the same time so that when you reconvene, you're all in a much more relaxed um, state of mind. We all have some things sometime by ourselves. So, taking everybody, so for everybody taking that time at the same time can really be a significant stress reducer for the whole household. We can, as we consider the quality of inside environment, these are just some of the tips, and I'm sure everyone can come up with many more. Living together in close quarters for a long period of time can be a challenge but also can be a time of opportunity for projects, talking about family history, um, discussing uh, doing a family project uh, that you ordinarily just don't have much time to do. 
everyone putting, sitting down and putting a large puzzle together. I know several people that are doing this during this pandemic and finding it quite relaxing. We will be providing you with several links that can take you, next sl slide, next slide, providing you uh, with several links. And do you want to click on one of those so I can show them just what type of information is out there? If it works, okay, didn't work. But these will be distributed and there's just so much information out there that can help you improve the inside of your environment. There you go, safer cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting strategies to reduce and prevent COVID-19. So specifically to COVID-19. So every one of those links can bring you to some really excellent reading material. Uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity to share these tips, and that's it. Thank you so much, Virginia. Uh, we appreciate you uh, coming and speaking and sharing those wonderful tips with us. I am now unmuting all of the speakers so that they can um, take your questions. And uh, please, if you would type any of your questions that you have in the chat box. And I am in the process of uh, sharing back our slide deck. So just bear with me while I get back to our slide deck. Um, I will uh, do that in just a second. Okay, our slide deck should be up. Um, and if someone else can see if that, if you are seeing our Q&A slide, if somebody can confirm that for me. Yes, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, great. Um, so um, if, you, uh, if you can please, if you would have any questions for our speakers um, in your chat box, you will find in the bottom of the screen. Um, uh, if you have some questions, you can type any questions that you have in the bottom of, this, uh, of the screen in your chat box. Some of you will find your chat box in the top of your screen. It depends on where it is for your Zoom. Um, and um, to start us off, we did receive a few questions to begin with, um, and um, this would go to Dr. Agarwal. Um, Dr. Agarwal, did, is there any evidence of uh, using cleaning products as being something um, that specifically triggers autoimmune disease and myositis? Um, uh, I don't know exactly about the cleaning product, but I know the dust and molds have been linked with various different autoimmune diseases, including myositis. But unfortunately, as, it, as with the studies with viruses and bacterial, there's been no conclusive link. So they all suggest that they could, in some studies, suggest they, one kind of mold or dust could trigger. Other studies suggest a different kind. So there's been no conclusive evidence, but there have been, there have been studies suggesting some link. Great, thank you so much. Um, we, uh, we also just received a question, um, and this would go to um, uh, Virginia. Um, Virginia, and, uh, and of course, any of other speakers can, can, can uh, chime in, um, and I will, I will push that out to you as well. Um, Virginia, do you know, should we um, be washing our masks that we're using out in public uh, frequently? Do you have any advice on washing masks? Well, uh, many people have now homemade masks that are made of cloth and will very easily washed and sanitized. But yes, because you, remember, you're wearing the mask to prevent breathing in so that those germs can be on the outside of that mask. Uh, and then you touch it to adjust it, which was one of the reasons why there was some concern about recommending masks to everybody, because we tend to adjust them. And then our hands are actually touching the outside of it. And then we touch our hair. Our, our eyes or something. So you have to be careful not to touch the mask uh, when you're trying to adjust it. But yes, sanitizing, it's a good idea, especially the ones that we're making, you know, the, that are being homemade. Thank you. And um, if anyone else has any thoughts on that, they can also weigh in. Okay, thank you. And um, now I'm going to um, present this question um, to either Felicia or Dr. Ventura. Um, both of you perhaps can weigh in because you both were focused on this quite a bit. But regarding smoke, someone says they have um, a neighbor who has a lot of outdoor fires. Um, 
And even though they, they have their windows closed, they often will have those campfires um, coming into um, the smells and the, and the senses of that campfire coming in. Does, is, is that a trigger that they should be concerned about? And um, uh, uh, perhaps I'll have um, uh, uh, Dr. Ventura speak and then, and then Felicia, if you wanna weigh in after. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is actually a very interesting question. So if we consider um, countries develop from developing economies uh, such as South America and Africa, uh, the most common risk factor for the development of chronic obstructive lung disease, um, which we, we, we abbreviate as COPD, it is the fuel that comes from the burning woods that families, particularly wife, uh, um, housewives, use to prepare the food. So the smoke that comes from these organic fuels are actually proven to, be, to contribute and to cause lung diseases and flares of lung diseases. So um, the impact of that on inflammatory myopathies and autoimmunities, I, I am, I'm not aware of a specific study, but from the perspective of lung diseases, this is definitely a well-recognized trigger. So yes, th th those campfires, have been associated with severe illnesses when it comes from the respiratory perspective. Great, and Felicia, did you wanna weigh in? Well, yes, and I was gonna say, if I could just piggyback on what Dr. Ventura said, my homeowners association, even though they wouldn't uh, ban the indoor aspect of smoke, they did ban the outdoor, if you will, um, grilling, not campfires, but grilling because it was barbecue pits that were causing the uh, smoke factor in the common areas because they did see the impact that the smoke had on um, the various neighbors, et cetera. So yeah, they did see that as a uh, negative risk factor, if you will, so. Great, thank you. Um, so this is for um, Dr. Agarwal. Dr. Agarwal, is there any um, advice you have on um, how far away people need to be from, uh, from uh, UV light, indoor UV light, or even outdoor UV light? Um, is there any evidence to demonstrate uh, what, what people need to do in order to protect themselves in that way? So uh, outdoor UV light, you can't be away. I mean, you're really away from sun. So it's not, uh, you know, what you need to do is use common sense protection. For example, using sunscreen is a very effective way from uh, mitigating the effect of UV light, using you know full sleeves, uh, shirts, and pants, um, uh, you know those are much easier way than thinking about how far should you be should you be in shade or uh, in direct sunlight. So if you're in shade, you're far protected than you are in a direct sun uh, exposure. But even when you're in direct sun exposure and you use these measures, you're far far protected than when you're not using these measures. Indoor, there have not been much studies done in terms of the UV exposure from indoor light. What I'm trying to say is that we need to be cognizant that there is also indoor UV exposure. So if you're using too much of those type of light, then sometimes, you know, darkening the room or, you know, somebody was talking about alone time or meditation, uh, you know, those type of things will be very helpful in reducing your overall exposure to all the environmental factor would be helpful. Yeah, and I would like to add on on that as well. Um, whenever we are, again, able to go outside and spend time outdoors, we need to remember that sunscreen is not something that we put on in the morning and it's valid throughout the day. Yeah. If, if, we are, if we are gonna spend time outside, um, it's really important that you bring it on, the sunscreen with you. So put in a purse, in your pocket, every two hours or even more often if the sun exposure is very intense, you need to reapply on every surface that is being directly um, exposed to sunlight. So sunscreen is not something uh, uh, that stays in for a long period of time. So reapplying is even more important than the actual number that you see in the label of the sunscreen, 15, 30, 45, the most important factor is reapplying. 
Great. Um, that, those are really helpful uh, tips. Thank you both. Um, uh, this I'll, I'll have Virginia weigh in, and then um, if um, if anyone else on the the panel wants to weigh in, because I think this has multiple people that can kind of um, help give some insights on this. But we had a question about disinfecting groceries and um, and bringing those groceries home. Tips on how to disinfect the groceries, and then how do you balance the disinfecting the groceries to the ex the chemical exposures um, on the food products. Well, uh, yes, you have to disinfect them. Usually, um, I find that the wipes work very well, but I try to do it in an area where I can open a window again to ventilate the area. And then you kind of wipe down the surface of the, the item and then let it set for a while because sometimes it can take a little while for the disinfectant to work. And you want to make sure on different, that's what I meant about different surfaces have different times that uh, the disinfectant works on. I would also like to just add to the sun discussion. Uh, having a person who's worn sunscreen all my life. Um, sometimes we forget, we think it's winter and we think the sun is not as bright, but the sun is can reflect off of snow and be really give you a significant um, exposure to sun. Water and snow will really reflect so you get the sun as it comes on you and then it's reflected back on you. So I just thought I would mention that too. And um, do, do any of our other panelists have any thoughts on how to limit the chemical exposure for disinfecting groceries and also packages? Some people were asking about disinfecting Amazon packages, which also piggybacks on that. Yeah, so um, one thing that is important when it comes to packages is trying to open and sometimes get, you know, get the content inside the packages even before you get inside your house. So try to open the packages out, even out of your home and then throw it away already uh, before bringing in the packages at home can be a, something fairly easy to do. And then as you come home, take off your clothes, wash your hands, so on and so forth. That can be something very easily, uh, uh, you know, done uh, b before you get into your house. The other thing is uh, vegetables, fruits, um, produce in general, don't need to be disinfected with hardcore um, um, products. So the usual way to clean those surfaces with you know, running water, sometimes uh, some other products can be used is more than enough. The virus usually don't last long on poor surfaces, such as the ones in produce. And, and if I could add, just as a, a patient, uh, as you know, with all of the things, I've seen um, uh, apple cider vinegar mm -hmm. as a way to disinfect uh, the vegetables and the produce that I bring in. And if I can go back to what Virginia said, thank you for reminding me about the sun issue. Because I have DM and I would go out to the pool for exercise in, during the day, I was introduced to a zinc-based sunscreen so mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have outbreaks. And I've been able then to not necessarily spend too much time in direct sunlight, but I don't have a break a rash i don't get a rash as a result of being in the sun anymore i should say so i don't spend too much time in it but because i use a zinc based sunscreen i can spend a few uh, moments in the sun without breaking out in a rash and so if they have it for the face and then the body as well so i just wanted to point that out um, well, before we jump off of this, um, before we jump off of the webinar, and I'm sorry, we are going to have to come to a close. We have lots of great questions, um, but somebody wanted to know what the zinc paste sunscreen uh, names is, and I don't want to leave that one to future future webinars. Um, could you? There, uh, there are there are several brands. Avino okay. makes a good one, and okay. usually it's the percentage twenty one percent okay. is the highest I've seen so far in terms of how much zinc is in the sunscreen. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So um, we, we have to come to a close, but we have lots of great questions. And what I will say is Dr. Agarwal is hosting um, a webinar. We're having a Q&A question uh, webinar um, coming up next week. So where you can bring your questions. So some of these great questions that we have, if, if you would like to ask some additional questions, um, uh, we can have a one-on-one -on -one question with Dr. Agarwal. He can field some of the additional questions that we're here that we just didn't have time to get to and we apologize, but there's so many wonderful questions to answer. 
So um, next week we will have a, a, a more questions that we can take on um, there. Um, this webinar will live on our website, on our webinar page, as they all do in a recorded session. Um, so you can click on and see the recorded version of this webinar there. Um, and don't forget, April 28th and 29th is our giving challenge, um, where we will have a one-on-one -on -one match provided to us by the Patterson Foundation for, uh, for donations up to $100. Um, so we have a minimum donation of $25, but this is a great opportunity to help support the Myositis Association and programs like this. So um, any, every unique donor that provides a donation to us will have their donation match up to $100. It's a great way to help provide support to us. So please um, let your friends and families know that you can really help us um, through that. And um, remember to fill out your post-webinar evaluation, which we will be sending out along with the helpful links that um, Virginia was able to provide us as well and sign up for our next webinar. And thank you all for joining us and thank you to our wonderful panelists for this incredible session. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you.